Well, hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of Social Theory. I am your host, Thomas E. Hanna, the host of blogphoto.tv, and I'm super excited about our show today. But I have to tell you, because uh, this, this is how Hangouts work, is everything on Hangouts on Air, you can get it to go perfectly leading up to the time until the broadcast. And then once you broadcast, any technical issue that you could possibly have likes to appear. It's sort of like they feel left out and they want to jump in. So right before we broadcasted, some of the little special video extras that I had planned to fit in here broke. So I'll get to tell you about those maybe, but we'll, but you'll have to surprise you on future episodes as to what some of those are. However, I do want to tell you that this is an interactive show, and I'm super excited about that. There's three ways that you can join in the conversation here with myself and our special guest today. The first, if you're watching on YouTube Live, just leave a comment there on that page. If you are on the Google event page, you can just leave a comment right there. We're tracking those. And if you're on Twitter, you can tweet your comments or questions to hashtag STshow, uh, and we will be tracking those and bringing those in for the second part of our show. And having said that, I can't wait to introduce you to who we have to sit down with today as we discuss the power of empathy in social media, because really, there's not a better person that we could sit down with. This guy is the Chief Communications Officer of Wheel Media. He is the voice of relationship marketing and the host of the relationship marketing show himself, Wade Harmon. How are you doing, Wade? Hey, now. I'm doing good, Thomas. Thank you so much for having me on the show really it's an honor to watch you watch you grow as fast as you've grown and and thank you so much for letting me come on today well I'm excited to have you on here Wade and I'm uh, I'm glad that we get to chat but one of the things that I've always loved connecting uh, with you on and really kind of following uh, and reading through your material is to look at uh, your journey I think a lot of us that have come into social media and begun using it uh, as a way to connect with our businesses or as part of our business model itself come from usually somewhere else or somewhere unrelated to it and then we find ourselves working our way in and you really have sort of this underdog story so tell us a little bit about you and how you came to be involved in uh, in social media and content marketing sure um, and I hope people don't get sick of uh of hearing me talk about this, but uh, I came uh, through social media and blogging and all this stuff through uh, after a stint of 10 years or so in the coal mines, and uh, that's what I did for a living. I was a uh, I was electrician at uh, Consol Energy, and I see uh, Eileen Smith is in the uh, the audience, and hey, Eileen. Uh, but there's uh, the the their headquarters is is up near where she is, so she probably knows where I'm, what I'm talking about. But uh, so I I started work for Consol Energy, and and one thing led to another. Got hurt, couldn't work, and I was out of a job. And so I wonder what in the world would I could I do, you know? Because nothing I didn't have didn't have the experience for marketing or didn't know really how to how this thing worked. So I just kind of clawed my way in into the industry. You know how some people say that you have to claw, we clawed our way to the top. I had to claw my way just to get started because I had no idea really what what was going on. Uh, didn't know really anything about it. So uh, I learned from people like, like Miss Eileen and, and she took me in and really helped me out a lot. And uh, uh, so that's basically where, you know, where, where I'm at now. I've, you know, been doing it for about four years or so and I'm just enjoying it. So, and you went from being a coal miner, um, and if I remember, as part of this, you actually uh, were in many ways thrust into finding a new industry because you had an injury that prevented you from continuing as a coal miner. And, yeah. and so you found yourself struggling to do that, but it sounds like from what you're saying is that relationships uh, were really a critical element that allowed you to connect in with some of this stuff. When you were talking about Eileen and some of the other people that you connected with, that transition point was really tied in with relationships. Would you say that's true? Yeah, most definitely. And and again, I was ignorant of the way that this whole process worked. I didn't know that you had to wait before you talk to an influencer. I didn't know these things. And 
And, and, and so one of the first people that was on my radar was Eileen Smith. Everybody says you gotta gotta go read basicblogtips.com. There's a plug, uh, Eileen. And, and so and, and this is what I did. And so so my goal was to just soak up everything I could from her because uh, a lot of the things that I'd been reading and learning were were the wrong things. They were you know, and I didn't know any better. I thought that I was supposed to do article marketing to get my you know, page or or blog post on the first page of Google. I thought I was supposed to build black hat links. I didn't know the difference between black and white SEO. I was just doing it. Yeah. And, and so, and I didn't know that there was, you know, stipulations to this stuff. And 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 there's not, there's not. But there's there's also a, a hidden type of uh, meaning when you when you come to these people of influence and different things like that. And so. And so, without having any of that knowledge in my head, I just went up to Eileen and said, "Hey, can you help me do something?" Uh, I think I was interviewing her. If, if if I'm wrong, Eileen, you you can let me know. I think I I think I went. I, I gave her an email list of questions that I wanted to ask her, and instead of just responding to the email with text, of regular email, she responded with an audio answer, and which was above and beyond. What you know, one could have done, and so uh, of course it just, you know, that you know, superstar in my book. I'll, I'll never forget Eileen Smith. No matter how far I make it, I'll, I'll always remember her. That's, I, I love the fact that you are, um, that you're making those connections. And, I, and I'll tell you, I, I resonate when you're talking about about these this idea of buying backlinks, and we need to establish ourselves on. Search and the way that you do that is you build up this backlink profile. Da, 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 da. When I first started blogging, I actually uh, first launched a blog called the Dust and King Theology blog, and it uh, over about a year it built up very, very prominently. And then uh, Google released one of their Penguin updates, um, and it killed it overnight. And I, I, you know, thought I was following advice that everybody was saying that I was picking up. Um, but the big transition for me that really allowed me to move out of uh, spinning my wheels and move into a position where things started happening was this concept of relationships, this concept of how we build connections with other people. And you really have keyed in on this with your, your discussion about relationship marketing. Uh, and you, in fact, you, <laughs> you cracked me up because you are you very clearly say I am not a relationship marketing expert I'm a relationship marketing enthusiast yet in many ways you've become uh, in many circles at least the voice of relationship marketing and have this leading show on relationship marketing that's killing it on iTunes uh, as well as here on on Google Plus when you talk about relationship marketing what I mean, how do we how do we connect those? Because a lot of times we think about marketing and we try to intertwine that with relationships. That really brings up a lot of concepts about that are very manipulative ideas. Yeah, it is. And you know, in reference to to all that, it's all part of my evil plan. I'm I'm getting you to believe what I want you to believe. <laughs> but and I'm good with that. You know, I think that's the way all marketers should go. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> But yeah, you're right. Relationship marketing is, and and I've even got a um, a post on my blog about why I hate relationship marketing, and it just talks about some of the things that I hate about it. Like it, it, it seems like when you say, "Well, try this relationship marketing technique," to da 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 da, and and when uh, I was on um, Manly Pinterest Tips a couple of weeks back, and he basically asked me this same question, and you know, look at look at the two words. Relationships, a beautiful thing, and then you tack on marketing. You can you can put marketing behind any word, and it automatically becomes taboo, or makes you think negatively of something like babies. Who everybody loves babies, but then put baby marketing, it makes you feel, look like a creep. <laughs> but <laughs> I have this sudden image of like you know uh, these black op operations in like third world countries where. You you have like mail order children that and so you're and you're talking about baby marketing. So you're right. You add marketing to the end of babies and things get dark real fast. It, it does. And relationship marketing it it was <clears throat> the the generic answer is 
Uh, it was defined as a form of marketing that developed from this direct response style marketing campaigns, which, which the strong emphasis was upon the the customer retention and satisfaction rather than uh, rather than a dominant focus on sales transactions. So so they were getting it really close right there. Uh, for me, the relationship marketing starts with with the one person, and you know I, wh there there is. You can call what I do. You you can title what I do, and you can title it relationship marketing. But whenever I go into it, it's just it's just Wade, and uh, how to this Wade is just me. It's how to Wade. Yeah, it, it, it's just me. It's the way I don't think of it like that. I, and this is just me and the way I am, um, the way I approached uh, Miss Eileen. I just that that's the way I would approach her if if I had known her from Adam and I had to approach her, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think of it as any type of of marketing, even though it is. Uh, it's just pure heart marketing. Uh, I I try I to. Like that. Yeah, pure I try to think. Marketing. Yeah, I, I just feel like that. You know, I'm not out to I'm not out to, you know, cut nobody's throat or or downgrade anybody. I'm just out to try to make a living for me and. My two kids and my wife, and and have fun in the process, and make as many friends as I can, you know, because I'm I want to help just as much as I want to get help. So, well, and that's the pivot point I think is when people are engaging, particularly with social media as a means for for promoting uh, either blogs or their business or their website or however that is. There's this initial mentality that's very much this madman sense that if we take what we're doing and we broadcast it and push it out to as many eyeballs as possible that that at least gets in front of people and that's how we gain traction. And the reality is that so much of this isn't built on the eyeballs that see it because there's just so much content. It's really built on the relationships that you build, the trust level that you're able to build, and people see, oh, Wade just published something new or Wade has a new show, and now they want to see it because... They've come to trust uh, your insights and and the connection that you have in this idea of genuinely caring. So I like I like that pure heart marketing. I think that really reclaims some of the genuineness uh, of of the whole process. Let, let's talk for a moment about empathy because I don't really think you can talk about relationship building in any genuine sense without also tacking on this empathy. And while I know that your background. Uh, is as a coal miner, I also know that you have a significant background in psychology as well. And I think you actually, that was your, was, it, was that your, what you studied in college was psychology or, or what, what was the psychology connection that you had? Yeah, um, I actually went, went to night school and got a master's degree in cognitive uh, psychology. Gotcha. So when we connect with these ideas of psychology and sociology and groups and our need for connection, empathy becomes part of that. So talk to us a little bit about uh, how empathy plays in, particularly over social media, where there's where there tends to be a little bit of a disconnect. Well, in order to understand empathy, you have to first start to understand how the human brain operates and the human psyche. The things that we do that we don't even realize that we do, like you breathe without realizing that you breathe. It's, it's those those little things that go unnoticed is what makes such a huge difference in relationship marketing. So uh, empathic capabilities in, in us, in humans, are, are considered to be part of our emotional intelligence. And so, see, we just opened up a whole new can of worms with, with the emotional side because I wrote a post about uh, how, how social media engagement is not that much of an emotional, from an emotional standpoint, but from a logical aspect, and and then then you go deeper than that, and and the emotions are the right side of the brain, which is you know your imagination and all this other good stuff, and your logic comes from the left side of your brain, which does not have any attachment whatsoever to your emotions. So when you're when you're showing empathy, you're using your right side of the brain, and and so empathy basically means when when we empathize with another person that that. That means we're able to see things from from their point of view, basically. Mm -hmm. So you're you're familiar with the phrase, uh, "Don't judge a man until you walk a mile in his shoes." Mm -hmm. So that that's basically speaking of 
empathy. And and the most important part about empathy in in the relationship building process is that you you got to be able to identify what the other person is feeling. And in in this hustle bustle world that and and online stuff that we're in, it's just so hard to stop and take time for that one individual. It's hard for me, and I work at it. Um, so you know it, everything's going fast. You got to you know you, I got to get to from point A to point C by Wednesday or today's Wednesday by today's Tuesday by by Thursday. So I got to do this this and this. And uh, so it, it makes us rush. It makes us, you know, forget about the things that go unnoticed. And so empathy is definitely something that can go unnoticed. And it's it, it can be used in approaching someone for the first time, like somebody that you don't know. And uh, like say, say if I didn't know you, Thomas, and I, I come up to you and I say, man. That was an awesome intro video that you have. That's so awesome. I loved it. And it was, by the way. I loved it. And, and so, yeah, so what you're doing, what I'm doing right now is even though I don't know you, I can empathize with you to have a connection uh, and, and to start a conversation with you because I know that you think the, the video is good because you put it up. So and, and it, it's, it can be used in a way to connect us further with, with other people. Yeah, and there's, I think you, you bring up some really good points in when we're engaging um, in social media that there's this analytical aspect and it's sometimes difficult to jump into that emotional thing even though that emotional jump is so critical. Uh, and one of the things that I, that I enjoy and that I see like really savvy brands doing is they're really effective at social listening and so when they have uh, positive things that are starting to be discussed about the brand, they're able to be aware of it because they're tracking, you know, discussions of their brand over social media, and they're and they're involved in it, and so they can get involved, which takes what's already a good experience and inflames it to a point where people are now talking about them, and there's a buzz. And on the flip side, when people have a negative experience, they're getting involved in it. And I've seen some that do this really well, that get involved and are able to, even if they don't necessarily have a solution to the problem, their ability to relate with what the person is going through and their challenge softens that blow rather significantly. Uh, and on the flip side, I've seen some people that, that do it really well, and it totally blows up. Uh, <laughs> brand image on social media. So no, no doubt. Let me let me jump in right there because I've got a perfect example of empathy with big businesses, uh, empathy in, in customer service and even relationship building with your followers is very important. We already know that that it is. Um, so here's a story. Uh, one day, like a month ago, my one of my my black ink printer printer cartridge. Uh, I just I just bought it took it out of the package, put it in, and it didn't work. And so uh, I had to drive all the way back to the to the store, the retail store, and say, you know, I had I had an idea in my head. Okay, look, I just need to exchange this. This didn't even work. I mean, it's not been used. Uh, but the manager came in, and they weren't empathic because they told me, well, we're going to have to take this cartridge and test it out to make sure you're not lying and then if if we find out that it's not you know if, it, if we find out that it is messed up then you can come back drive the 20 minutes that you drove here and then you can exchange it so come on that that's not good customer service and, and you mentioned that with for, brands for an and, ink cartridge <laughs> yeah yeah I mean no doubt it was 35 bucks but uh, which is ridiculous by the way, if you ask me, but to be to to have empathy is probably one of the first steps in the relationship building process, and you don't have to know somebody to have empathy. Mm -hmm. And and a, a lot of these brands, you know, Walmart doesn't know who I am, but at least they let me exchange stuff for crying out loud, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I love, uh, and we've got we've got some great people here in the audience, and I've been watching some of the conversation uh, taking place, and so I, I do want to give give a shout out to them. But I also have um, 
a comment that came up that I really, really like. Uh, but I do want to say hi to Kristen Drysdale. I'm glad that you were able to make it. I see that you said your appointment uh, was canceled. Uh, Missy J, always glad to see you here. Andrea, uh, I'm sorry, Andrea belts for me, although I call her Annie. I, I prefer that. She it's pretty French. much fun. She wants to kill me when I do, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> who, by the way, uh, Andrea is the one who did all the design for the logo that you see right here. Uh, and the logo that was used in the video, the logo that's been used in the quotes, all of that stuff. That was her design. She did a fantastic job with that. Uh, I see Elaine Nieberding in here. It's good to see all of you folks here. I'm glad you guys can make it. I love this comment because it goes right back to what we're talking about. Uh, Wade from Katrina when she talks about she talks about empathy and she says see if I can get it up here and she says empathy allows you to put yourself in your clients shoes and find ways to connect with them emotionally so you start building trust in a real way uh, and I think that really nails it yeah right on yeah I, I agree with that and and then again you know I'm, I got a, I got a lot of flack for writing that post about how social media is an emotion is not an emotional platform, but I'm not saying that emotions can't be had. I mean there there's extra steps that you can take to to make that emotional connection, and brands that are taking the extra step, just like uh, Eileen Smith did when she could have written out her answers, but yet chose to give me an audio response. Take that extra step, and and it does it. It does build trust with your followers, and it and it helps your brand out a whole lot more. No, I, I mean I I absolutely I absolutely agree. Well, I, I wrote something down while I was uh, getting ready for the show. <laughs> there was an author whose name is James Berger. He wrote this. He says, "My idea of empathy is the ability to try to realize how other people feel and adjust one's behavior to take into account these feelings." Now get this, as a marketer or salesperson, understanding the feelings and needs of the customer is crucial to making that sale or exchange and for maintaining the long-term relationships. And he goes on to say, but yet look at these people and organizations trying and sometimes failing to survive and how they have completely disregarded the the concept of empathy. And that's, that is a, I mean, here's another story. And, and I'm going to pull it around to this. Uh, uh, back in the day, when I was working underground, there there was a miner that was broke down. Now the miner is the main machine in a coal mine. It's got it's got a drum on the front with teeth, and the thing circles and it goes into the uh, into the coal block. And so, well, the miner the the miner cat pads were down, and a cat pad is like those tracks that are on a bulldozer, right? And uh, the reason it was down was because the chain link had broke and so I went in there and I was fixing fixing the miner and I got down to the problem and one little leak no bigger than two or three inches was was broke one little link just shut the whole operation down for three hours Wow! and and, and that that can be the connection that you're missing if you're wondering I mean it doesn't have to be a big thing you don't have to be great at a big thing. Be great at a small thing because it's the small things that make the machine run. Mm. And I think I think the small things are what differentiates uh, the really effective uh, the brands that are really making things happen um, and the ones that see the big picture and are trying to do big scale things but are failing to connect on those really uh, those those tight levels and it's usually with those those small things although I will also say uh, that the brand that a lot of this emotional connection also comes back to how well you're able to tell your story and in and embody story they had a study that that came out that um, uh, that I read uh, just a few months ago that was talking about how story impacts your actual neurochemical blah 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 in the brain that was me trying to sound all like fancy scientific. Yeah, I definitely have that in my brain. Blah blah blah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Those 
fluids inside your head. That's we're gonna go with that. That's my technical. <laughs> well, well, let let me let me piggyback that because um, uh, the American Psychological Association says that um, there 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 are a couple general empathy attributes that everyone around you wants to see, and one of those is storytelling. Mm. Storytelling. Do you remember? Do you remember what the other ones are? We're going to come back to them here in just a moment. But I, I, if you remember what some of these others are, yeah, and and this, this can be this can be a great way to, to put your brand out there to, with people that you don't know, or if you're trying to, you know, pinpoint a certain target market. Uh, of course, storytelling, and 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 we've heard that sermon preached thousands of times. So uh, you already know about storytelling. Another one that you may not know is that we're suckers for instant gratification. So uh, many psychological studies, they demonstrate and explore that natural desire to have something now. That's why we have um, you know, fast food restaurants where we can get a full meal in five minutes or we can nuke a pizza in three minutes. It's We can send a text around the world in seconds. So it's it's fast, fast. So if you can give some something to somebody and you can do it fast, that's instant. That's you know you're fulfilling that instant gratification uh, in in their in their life. Um, and the next one is that people just want to belong somewhere, and that that's all. These all surround this these empathic uh, features that you have to have. Hmm. So we're going to come back to those in just a moment. Uh, but first, we have now passed the halfway point. According to the big green social theory clock, we have now passed the halfway point in the show. And you know what that means, Wade Harmon? What? That means it's time to play this or that. And here's how we play this game. This yes. game... This or that, yes. So here's how we play this game. In a moment, I am going to draw um, a random card from my deck of Would You Rather cards. Each card is going to have four questions on it. Those questions are going to present you with a uh, selection of two possible scenarios. And they will span, each question will be one of four categories. We'll deal with uh, fear and discomfort, appearance or embarrassment, ethics or intellect, and then the last question will be, will be a random question. You will have to choose this or that and then tell us why you made the choice. <laughs> okay. Are you ready to play, Wade Harmon? I ready as I'll ever be, I reckon. All right. Then here we go. I'm going to cut the deck and we will go. How do right. I know you've All not right. already like picked the questions out that you or the cards that's, out? That's, that's why I'm like shuffling this right in front of you. <clears throat> can see me fiddling around. I actually shuffled uh, it a minute ago, uh, oh. but now I'm fumbling the deck around here so we can do it, and I'll, and I'll cut it in half now and switch it around, and this top one is what I'm going to go from. So here we go. Ready? All yep. right. In a sudden, huge thunderstorm, would you rather be caught 15 miles out to sea on a jet ski or one mile out on a windsurfer? Oh geez, it's got to be both one one or the other. It's gotta be I don't want to be out in the middle of the sea any, anywhere. <laughs> yeah, Is there a meter? The <laughs> I don't make the rules. It's my show, but I am. Okay, all right, so would you rather a jet ski or a windsurfer? Uh, well, no, no, no. It's a jet ski fifteen miles out, okay. or a windsurfer one mile out. The jet ski got full tank of gas. <laughs> Yes, for this we'll say it has a full tank of gas. Jet ski, baby. Jet ski for that reason. Jet ski. For that reason. All right, so I, I chose the jet ski because um, sometimes you can't rely on the wind. <laughs> Maybe the wind will yeah. stop blowing. <laughs> Yeah, now, if you were in the middle of a, a sudden huge thunderstorm and the wind stops blowing, you just got to know you're in trouble. Cause that's the eye of the storm. You're in the eye of the storm. <laughs> <laughs> you're dead anyway, so it don't, don't matter. At that point, it's done. <laughs> All right, question two. Would you rather be a gorgeous person of the opposite sex or keep your gender but be hideously ugly? I'd, I'll stay ugly. You'll go. You'll keep your gender and remain ugly. Okay. And why? 
Oh man, I don't know if I want to get into this. <laughs> All right, we'll just leave it at that. You would rather you would rather remain male. Okay, we'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> we, won't, we won't get you in too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, All right. Well, well I, I'll give you a couple examples. Okay, so when 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 I first got married, when I first got married, uh, one one of the, this is one of the reasons why I wouldn't want to be. Do what? I missed it. I said suddenly changing your gender would weird your wife out. Okay, here here's an example of why I wouldn't. <laughs> So when I first got married, um, this is literally the next day when we wake up and took a shower, everything dried off, you know, and uh, I started feeling scratchy, itchy, you know, like, what in the world? And so I, I got dressed and put put on my underclothes and t-shirt and all this stuff and, you know, started itching down there. I was like, what in the world is that? And so I reached down into my drawers and pulled out this huge... It's huge hair, <laughs> and from that moment on, there's hair everywhere. I mean, even today, there's hair everywhere. So, and and I remember my sisters doing that a lot too. So, I wouldn't want to shed like that. <laughs> uh, okay, cool story. Um, <laughs> All right, uh, we're gonna move on now. <laughs> The dangers of this game. Question yes. number two. I, I don't care to tell you, man. I'll tell you. <laughs> this is this is this is getting to know you better. Uh, question three: Would you rather have only older siblings who tease you incessantly, or only younger siblings who depend on you all the time? Younger. Because. Um, I feel like I have I feel like I have a a caring spirit about me, and mm -hmm. so I would I would enjoy taking care of, of them. I enjoy taking care of my family, so I know I would enjoy that. All right, well that's a good one. Okay, here and here's the last one, the random question. Are you ready? Yep. Would you rather descend from a helicopter 1,000 feet high by sliding down a 1,000 foot long metal pole, or by jumping under the magical condition that promises you will be saved if you can land on your feet. Who's going to land on their feet from a thousand feet in the air? <laughs> a cat? <laughs> yeah, must, uh, uh, I guess I would not want to do either one of those. I would say, I would say a pole, I guess, and I have no reason for why. <laughs> At least you got something to hang on to. Yeah, yeah there you go. All right, Th those are your four questions. I think we all know you a little bit better, Wade. In fact, after these, I think we may know you a little bit more than we probably wanted to. This has been this or that. <laughs> and, if you, <laughs> and if you guys want your own deck of, of Would You Rather cards, I included a link in the description to where you can where you can get them. But now I want to go ahead and I want to dive in. We've got some great questions coming in. I want to remind you guys, if you have questions for myself or for Wade, uh, you can leave them either by uh, tweeting them to hashtag STShow or by leaving a comment on the event page. We've got some good ones coming in. Missy J had a question. And I, I want to I go on record as, as showing that uh, everybody sees this too. So Joe Ray said his three sisters do that. And Missy is saying, yeah, girls shed, so or yeah, was there you we are. about the underwear part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, there you go. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Joe yeah. says, let's see if he gets in trouble for this, and I'm going to put him up on the spot. Yep, my three sisters do that, too. Growing up, there were long hairs all over the bathroom. David, uh, David Stevens is getting a little bit worried. He wanted to know, where is this going, Wade? <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't, I don't blame him on blame him on that. Um, and then, uh, on Andrea said that took a different direction than it sounded like it was going. Thank God. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have a tendency to do that sometimes. Yeah, so um, a little scared, but we brought it back together at the end. There, I do want to dive into some of the questions that we have coming up here because we've got we've got some really great ones. I want to get back up uh, to the top here and yeah, hold on. Because I scrolled way down further than I meant to. All right. Um, <clears throat> Eileen says she, she'll take the younger siblings as well. All right. 
Missy J had a great question that brings us back to what we were talking about. She wants to know what is the best way to merge empathy with marketing, and this this really kicks us off in, in terms of our segment of how do we get how do we get super practical in talking about how to implement this. So, what do you what do you think, Wade, in terms of ways to merge empathy with marketing? And I'm going to add to that, particularly marketing on social media. What are some practical things that we can do to bring those together? Well, one of the one of the things that I would start doing first is to um, of course, start engaging with people, but don't forget about the APA, um, the APA uh, attributes is what they say of em empathy, of what people want. So first, I think we got to throw the marketing word out of the window, and just just keep just keep the empathy. Uh, so, and the way you do that is, uh, like I said before, tell the good story, um, help people. And do it in a in a expedious way or expedient way, excuse me, and and allow people to to come into your group, uh, come into your clan or whatever it may be. There there is a tight knit group everywhere you go. You'll find a tight knit group of people somewhere, and the way you get into that is just you know talk about things that they're talking about. You're not going to get in right away. Not saying that, but if you're consistent with, you know, seeing things from their point of view, and and if you can't see things from their point of view, that don't mean you can't. You're supposed to walk away from them. It just means, you know, understand at least understand where they're coming from. If you can see things from their empathy, it doesn't mean agree. It means to you know to understand. Mm -hmm. And so, friends can have uh, disagreements and arguments. Um, and you know, just be there when they need you. And in fact, in some cases, empathy really comes into its own and shines when there's a disagreement. So your ability to disagree in a compassionate way, but be but be clear on understanding the other person and the perspective that they're bringing. Um, I mean, that's I think it, it's in disagreements and empathy becomes doubly. Yeah, and and disagreements are okay, and mm -hmm. you're you're totally right. But what what I see happening, I see a lot of arguments online. Um, what I see happening is the the two sides, one of the two sides at least, will will start to get upset. They'll start to feel um, angry, whatever it may be, because they can't bang their opinion into somebody's head, and that's not being empathic. It's really trying to learn, and I think Vincent Messina is probably the best guy to to do this. He that dude can argue with a brick wall. He's really good, but he he really tries to understand. He's got his opinion, and he knows what his opinion is, but he wants to know what you think, and he 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 pushes you to tell him what you think. And it's not like he's disagreeing with you, but he he wants to understand, and I think that's. That's a good uh, mantra to have when you're if you ever find yourself in an argument, because look, I mean, last thing in the world you want to do is to be in a heated argument on social media where your followers can see you, where people of influence can see you. It's it's not good to let people see you get upset, lose your temper, and all that. But it is good to see to let them see you control yourself. And and that you do know what you're talking about. Yeah, and I, I want to touch base. You made the link between empathy as understanding. Robert Ryan really connected with that. Uh, but I like the way that Joe also takes this um, in terms of asking sort of this critical question. He says, um, and he agrees with you. He says you need to ask yourself, does this help people? And I think. Really, in everything that we do, any time that we are producing, whether it's a service or it's a product or uh, it's the way that we're carrying ourselves, ultimately what makes it effective is that it solves a problem or that it helps people. Uh, so being able to ask that is not only critical, but it reminds us that if we want to be able to help people, we have to be able to understand what the problems that they're facing are, what the struggles that they're dealing with are, 
and um, then be able to respond to those, which requires us to be able to get into their shoes. Yeah. Agree with and, that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I just said, would you agree with that? No, definitely. I definitely would, and and it, it wouldn't be no problem at all for me or any of uh, any of us um, in the event page right now to go out and just write a blog post about what we wanted, about what we enjoyed, and and this and that, and just send it out into the internet and pray to God somebody likes it. But you know that that's not being. You can be. You can have empathy in your writing because of what you just said. You have understood what what people want. Um, you understood people's point of view, the way they see things, and, and so you're bringing it around. Uh, maybe you're not. You're, maybe you're not hitting the empathy bullseye dead on, but in the attributes that the APA says, you're you're showing the instant gratification. You're telling the good story, and in that good story, you are you are uh, fulfilling what they want or what they need, and that's there's an empathic blog post. Yeah. So, in fact, let's let's um, dive into each of those because you made you listed some really good things that, if we take those into mind, can really drive uh, very actionable decisions on how not just how we uh, interact, but also how we design the user experience on our site, how we establish our email marketing, how we carry ourselves on social media, all of that. So, you listed three. You and let's go into these these um, in order. You listed storytelling. Uh, you listed instant gratification, and you listed belonging. And any one of these could wind up being a show um, in and of itself. So I don't want to necessarily go all of that. But let's let's look at some practical tips on each one. So now you really value yourself as a storyteller. And I know particularly uh, within the past few months, you have put concerted effort into elevating your uh, capabilities in storytelling. What are some tips you would give to help people tell stories in a way that reflects their brand and connects with their target audience? Well, w one of the things that I did myself, I understood that there was there was something I was missing in in these posts that I was writing because I'm I'm I am a comparer. Uh, for myself, I look at my content, and then I then I go and look at somebody like Damien Farnworth, and of course there's no comparison whatsoever. But I look at his content and I see how easy it reads, how how effortlessly, uh, you know, my eyes scan across the page, and then I find myself chuckling here and there, and then I find myself wincing, you know, I, he just he sucks me in. And so one day, I mean, it's been a while back, but one day I was like. I'm not doing this. I, I've been doing this for three and a half years. I'm not doing it now. So what can I do to do this? And so one of the things that I did that that really aligned me up, and I'm not there yet. I don't think that I am, uh, but I, I'm, I'm working on it. But it's a compilation of, of knowing sentence structures and then another compilation of understanding how to make how to make it flow. From one heading tag to the next, mm -hmm. and and these are things that I learned that I learned from him. And everybody's got a good story to tell, everybody does, but not everybody can transfer that story from their brain to their website. And that's that's the bridge that you need to figure out for yourself. It's different for everybody else. Um, Damien can can sit down and just write like the wind, and it'd be perfect. And uh, but me, I have to sit down and think about it. I've got I've got Evernote notes, uh, just hundreds of them, for the stories that I've tried to put down on paper and can't finish. But I but I come back to them every now and then, or I'll change something out. It's it's you have to evolve as a writer. It's it's it is right. It's writing evolution that you want to do better. And if you're not going, if you don't want to do better and evolve. Then you will become extinct in this storytelling world. Yeah, and I and I think you know I mentioned earlier that there's an impact that that storytelling has on the chemistry in your brain. One of the things that I found was particularly interesting about that is that when people read stories, 
the areas of your their brain that connect with memory, that connect with experience, that connect with the senses, they all start lighting up. So people don't just read stories, they experience them. And so being able to tell experiences uh, in ways that engage the senses really elevates that that level of storytelling. Brian Clark, uh, who's another fantastic uh, storyteller, uh, he identified, and this really helped me, he I'm not even sure if I can really remember all of them, but he identified five ways that you can really kindle the imagination. Uh, one of them are with shocking statistics. So when you throw something out that kind of, it is the data, but it catches people off guard and makes them wonder what that triggers things. Uh, another one is um, like painting with images you know, yeah. uh, using using imaginative descriptions. Uh, a third one were analogies and metaphors. Um, and that I like to use a lot because I like to try to tell a story that I can use as a metaphor later on. And I, and I try to use unconventional ones because I, well, I like when I say something, uh, you know, like, uh, crafting a headline is like signing up for the Fight Club, and I, because I, I wrote an article about yeah. that, and people are like, "What? What are you talking about?" And I go through the rules of Fight Club and how that applies to crafting headlines, and so um, it creates this this uh, way of integrating. Um, and he had two others that I'm I'm forgetting offhand, but some of those are real practical ways to bring that in. Now, definitely, uh, I, one thing I want to add before we go further yeah. is. It, it, you're right to to be able to use those metaphors and similes and things like that that paints the picture in the reader's head and now your content's working uh, mm -hmm. when, when this hangout is like a bomb exploding inside of a watermelon you, you get that mental image of just red going all over the place and and make sure to I've learned this uh, in in storytelling you have to you have to make people aware um, you have to grab their interest, uh, learn the desire of what they need uh, to accomplish or their goals, and if you can do awareness, interest, desire, then the action comes because that's that's really what you're focused on. I mean, you can create an an empathic blog post that tells a good story, makes them aware, and then if they're aware, and then you start using these metaphors, then their interest starts to peak up because you're you're painting a picture, and so then you hit them with, you know, the desire part. Uh, Buffer wrote a post that I, I've got it on my on my whiteboard. It talks about writing, and some of the things that that you can use inside of of your writing. Uh, one of the one of the ones I love to write. And I'm reading it now. It says uh, you have to have a before, which is here. Here's your world now as it is. So explain where they're at. Maybe tell your story. Oh, I know the post you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, and then you have to have an after. What would it be like having your problem solved? And then the bridge. How are you going to get there? Mm -hmm. And, and, that, and sorry, sorry. that that structure really works well with integrating empathy into your writing because what you're doing by that structure is you're saying, look, there's a pain point, and you, at some level, are aware of it. But let me help you. First of all, understand why that's a pain point and why, it, rather than it being sort of this ethereal thing that's just kind of out here, you bring it together with they and say, okay, yeah, that's the issue that I'm having. And then you can say, all right, so here's the problem that you're having. Here's now the solution to that problem, which is which is the flow of this uh, that you were laying out, the buffer laid out, that before, uh, the after, and the bridge in between. But it allows that emotional connection. Um, which, which I think is critical. I, I wanted to move on. You had two other points that you mentioned. You also talked about instant gratification, the sense that when people have a problem, or, or even if it's not necessarily a problem, have a need, the ability to provide an immediate uh, access to something that, that addresses that need uh, makes you valuable and establishes this connection because you're, you're a helpful person now. Uh, what are some ways that you can incorporate into your site, into your social media, that you can incorporate uh, this concept of instant gratification? One of the first things I would do is to set up social listening. And mm -hmm. you can do social listening. A good, a good one is Hootsuite. 
um, set up different keywords, um, something that's in your target market, or or if you you know you, somebody mentions you on Twitter. I um, about a year ago, there was a little client that I was working with was fixing to start work with them, and um, so I tweeted I tweeted to him on Twitter and I said I said how are you doing today, and just at mentioned them and everything, and I was testing them to see how fast they would respond to see if I needed to work on the Twitter aspect of the social and and so that people people can can respond or you know just start a conversation with you on social just to see how fast you're going to reply they may not need anything uh, I've had it done to me before um, and so social listing would be definitely one of the number one things that I would start for the instant gratification the second thing would be is if your blog offers any help whatsoever and somebody goes to your site and they sign up for your course or, or this or that one of the things that I have on my own blog is there of course there's uh, content writing that, that I can do and, and different different things like that but I've got I've got two courses that are instant and one of them is of course the relationship marketing course and then the other one is the how to get a sponsor for your hangout and uh, oops, was that me baby uh, anyway and this is one of the things that I would set up if I was if I was you guys on your blog create something that helps people uh, meets their needs and when they when they get it it's boom it's there for them it's it's right there and uh, there you go instant gratification that's what you need to work on. Something that uh, that's really so easy that I find like blows people out of the water, uh, and it shouldn't. It really shouldn't. But it's so it's just not done often enough that it actually surprises people. Is when you have an email list that people subscribe to, you set it up so that if somebody responds to that, instead of it going to some void email account somewhere, you actually get that response, and then you reply to it. People, if for some reason it blows people's minds that, oh my gosh, this, I responded to an automated email and got a real answer from a real person uh, that just seems to, to blow them away. Another thing that I found that, that helps with instant gratification, I actually use this to help build my list, is um, we talk about content upgrades. So uh, what content upgrades are is if you post an article that is dealing with a particular pain point, uh, my, my most recent one, uh, dealt with what are what are some of the elements? How do you plan out um, an article uh, so that you can be able to write it and have it be impactful? And I go through that, which so people that are reading that want to know how to do it. But then I include also you can sign up right here, and I'll send you uh, and I'll send you an outline for it with fillable fields, so that you can actually have a resource to be able to do that. And people sign up, they get that immediately, and not only does that build the email list, but that ties into this meeting needs and this instant gratification. We're we're running we're running real short on time, so I want to very briefly talk about this last one: uh, empathy and the sense of belonging. And I know that you do this uh, you do this with your email list as well, with this concept of you're not just signing up to get a newsletter. You're you're subscribing to become part of a group, to become part of a particular tribe. Uh, and there's this corporate identity that you build into your email list. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, just like you said, people want people want to belong to something, um, even if you might not you might not know it yet. But everybody wants to be wanted, and so and I do. Um, my email list is the insiders. Call them the insiders. I've got a little name for them, and it it just. When I when I do the call to action for the list, either on Google Plus or if it's uh, over on my blog, I think I might have changed it on my blog. But on Google Plus, uh, I, I tell them say join a group of your peers, and it's called the Insiders List. You know, give it a name, and it's it, now it becomes um, more personal to these people. It it becomes more attractive to to everyone, and uh, and it's always a good thing to include some type of group. Uh, a group deal. Now, I, I wanted to get into this one too because, and I don't know how much time we have, but um, as we was sitting here talking about the belonging, and mm -hmm. people can, people can create groups 
and clans, uh, whatever it may be, uh, different ways. And uh, there was a sociologist that I studied um, when I was getting my degree. Was, his name was George Simmel, and he argued that sometimes we, we create common enemies. So like uh, you and I, Thomas, uh, we got a person that we don't like, so we create this common enemy that it, it that it unites us with groups of people. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the I hate Bob group or something like that. And people do this. There 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 are people out there that maybe you don't really like that well, and maybe there's somebody that you know don't really like that well too. So and he, here's the whole basis of that. Um, a group creating process with, with an enemy it's it's easier for us to tailor messages that play up our strengths versus someone else and and I know that a lot of people will go, no I don't have any enemies and and I'm sure you don't have enemies it's not like an enemy type deal but maybe it's a person you don't really click with or job with we all have those types of people even even me being in relationships there's people that that I don't click with and even though I've tried to go in and and give it another shot it just didn't seem to work out so sometimes people will create groups and and I've I've, I've got groups created against me <laughs> and it's just it's just human nature and I don't, I, they, I, they I, won't I belong groups wait yeah, you, did you start one of them? I figure. So, uh, and that that's a great way to do like competitors. So if you have a competitor um, that that's you know doing doing about the same thing that you're doing, you you study that competitor. You start to understand what they're not doing, and then you do that. So in a sense, you're taking a competitor, uh, an enemy, quote unquote. And you are playing up your strengths versus their weaknesses, and that resonates very well in the marketplace. Uh, you, you remember the commercial that Sprint had about cut your bill in half uh, with AT and T and Verizon? Yes, that's, that's enemy marketing. <laughs> yeah, that's the, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <clears throat> that's that's enemy marketing. It's it's leveraging the weakness of another business to make you, yourself look good. And while you know, I, I'm trying. I guess I should have studied this out a little bit more, but because uh, I don't, I don't have any particular examples of this. But there are businesses that that do this type of marketing. Right. Well, and and wait, and I'm gonna comment on this, and then we have a few comments I want to highlight, but then and then we'll go ahead and close up. But um, sometimes it's not always necessarily that malicious, though, either for. Part of identifying who you are as a group and as a tribe is to not only identify what you stand for, uh, but also what you stand against. So, so it may not necessarily be I'm against a person, but there are certain practices that I that I stand against. And, and in fact, um, yep. one of sort of the sub goals of Blog Photo uh, TV and and even this social theory is. That I really, I really emphasize. I really focus in on the emphasis on relationship building in social media and those marketing channels. That's I really think that not only is that where business is going, but I think that's a really important aspect of business that needs to be reclaimed. And so, in that way of thinking, um, I stand for this uh, collaborative approach and this relationship building and helping approach and I tend to stand against this sort of mass marketing uh, blasting approach and so in that case part of what I do does incorporate does incorporate enemy marketing even though I'm not targeting a particular person but I am targeting a particular practice and I don't think that's as malicious but it's still identifies as a group what you are for and what you are against. I want to highlight real quickly some of these and then we're, I know we are, we're hitting the time here real quick. So um, Eileen had a, actually a couple of, of uh, really good comments here. She pointed out that continuing to learn uh, and improve is important as long as the listening inside is still going on. And this last part I really clued in on that it's not solely about formula. 
Um, I think that's really critical because we oftentimes, particularly in social media and a lot of these uh, digital type avenues, we look for what is the formula that will help me be successful and oftentimes uh, it's not about formulas. Formulas help give us a starting point but then it's both in terms of both about self-examination and what I want to accomplish and uh, social listening and what, I, and what other people want to accomplish. She went on um, to ask this question, which I, I think is, is a good one. Uh, she said that uh, so many email lists are inviting for insiders. Uh, but he wants to say, well, this term die in effectiveness, though, I just see it getting used a lot. And she's on... Um, She's on yours. Uh, I talk about the insiders. Um, Andrea uh, talks about the insiders. I think Carrie Ann Foster talks about the insiders. Dustin Stout talks about the insiders. And I actually got it from Dustin Stout. He says he coined, he picked up the term from someone else, and, and he just found that it really connected with what he was wanting to build with that. Um, but what, what do you what do you think? And we'll, we'll keep this real brief because we're already we're already about a minute over. Yeah, no, I, I see what she's saying, and I, I can agree with her. You know, we we get we get bored with stuff, and so mm -hmm. it, it could possibly die out. You know, I'm not, you know, I can't see the future or anything, but I I, I see it a lot. I, I see not the future, but I do see <laughs> in the term insiders list used a lot. So if people are getting used to it, then you know maybe they're like, why well, why do I want to be in that group? And it's yeah. it's you know, it's all about trying to get, trying to make those people feel special, and so yeah. maybe we might have to come up with another, another name. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think I think what she's getting at that I and I, I I tend to agree with this to a point is that it's shifting from being that that terminology is beginning that transition from being a, a descriptive term that helps people feel like they're on the inside scoop with something to being a buzzword. And buzzwords tend to lose their effectiveness, and so I think that I, I think there's some validity to that. Um, but you know, that's also part of social media and part of part of content marketing is that you're aware of what what's going on, and you have to be willing to evolve and, and change and transition. Uh, otherwise, if I was if I'm doing today the things that worked in 1998, I I, I certainly wouldn't be on Hangouts. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, wait. Tell us. I know we're we're over time. So, tell us uh, where can we find you at? You can find me at wadeharmon.com, and uh, right here on Google Plus all day long. I usually have it open. So, if you ever need to uh, talk to me or need any help, just plus mention me. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being on the show. Those of you who want to connect with Wade, uh, if you look in the description. Uh, box below, there is at the very bottom, there's a section there that says important links. Uh, the special guest, Wade Harmon, I think is the first link in there. You can link over to his website or to him right here on Google Plus and be connecting. And I, uh, I really, he's got some really great stuff going on and getting into his insiders list. Uh, I, I highly recommend that. Um, and there's some other stuff there as well. My name is Thomas Hanna. I am super excited that you were able to join us. And I'm going to linger here in the comments for a little while longer. So if you have questions, continue to throw that up. Uh, but having said that, thank you folks for joining us. And I'll see you next week when we sit down with Mia Voss. I'll talk to you then. <laughs>